it up so. Please lift up the lid in front of you and start eating your biscuit. Oh! What in the... I got lost. <laughs> You got cookies. I got cookies. <laughs> <laughs> I feel the frustration in you, Raquel. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Just give half of mine, and if you could ha give half of his the legacies. No, it's not fair. Who wants one? Put one on there. Is that for me to read the title or what? <laughs> oh. I love those cookies. Give me. Ooh. Yay. <laughs> it was embarrassing. You snap that one in half. This what one? one? This one? No, that one. Yeah, that's fair. Yay. Yeah, that's fair. Thank you. <laughs> this plate is for a child who has never eaten biscuits. What in the? What? Okay. <laughs> Nothing. What? What? No cookies. There's no biscuits. Nothing. I think I should put one. Now we're going to have something sweet. I'll do that. We like to be kind. Other people need them more than us. It would be kind of nice giving um, something that they've never tried so they could try it and see how good it is. Oh! What in the... I got lost it. <laughs> <laughs> you got cookies. I got cookies. And I swear I only sit this sleep. أنا لها تفيدي في مخيم تعتري أنا بدي أتعلم أحب ألعب مع البنات نلاص مع بعض دائما تعيبها هي يصير الصف الأول نوي ناري أنبو دي ميجوة جنبيوي نجري من جريد فايف بونا أغا وميا كاجابو نيا تاريغا Dari mungkin di sini, dari bawa barang, ada yang di rumah nana boleh ambil. Kaca boleh di bawah dia bawa barang, aku lembah nama. Mereka nama kita kali orang berbara bersama. Mereka buat ama India ama kamp kau lagi bersama. Malai kini awak pun nama macam tu, bawa orang buat ama macam tu. Malay porna kini awak ni bawa semua kiri dari takkan sakti awak ni rasa porna mana aja. Malay tu le bawa pasti mana sebab nama aja, nama sebab ni rasa. Me llamo Isaia, tengo 13 años y vivo en un barrio donde corre la pobreza y la inseguridad. Llegar a la escuela es una gran oportunidad para aprender. Y para el futuro. En la escuela nos dieron computadoras y ahora tenemos un nuevo profesor que nos está enseñando a programar. Lograr ese, lo que siempre quise, trabajar con la informática. La ciencia fue buena. Hola, la We can all agree their names should be writ large. Now it is their faces that will be displayed on billboards above us around the country. 
a cross-section of frontline NHS staff, including a nurse, a consultant, paramedics, a porter, a cleaner. Their portraits taken by Rankin, one of the most famous photographers in the world. These pictures are now there forever about what you guys have gone through. And yeah. that's, that's really special. It's such a, not just a morale booster, but it's such a, it's such an affirmation of actually what people in the NHS do. It, it's amazing. It really has been amazing. And the photo was so great. It was so good. To, it felt like it was me on there. The 12 subjects were chosen to represent workers whose jobs have been critical during the pandemic. It's a surreal moment, but it's a heartening moment because it's been quite a lonely time. I think it's been a lonely time for everybody. And I think the sense of unity we've got from seeing our colleagues in the NHS and representing what we do has been really heartening. It's made me really happy. Rankin, whose previous subjects have included the Queen, photographed the staff while observing social distancing behind a plastic sheet. He worked in hospital theatres as a porter when he was 20 and offered to do the pictures as a tribute. It was incredibly emotional because not only was I um, going into this situation wanting them to be amazing, but I also was dealing with this thing of being, you know, two metres apart and trying to chat to them and get to know their stories, which felt for me to be really rude. What was brilliant, I thought, was um, how humble each person was. It was, not one person was like, yeah, I'm a hero. Not one person said anything apart from, this is my job. This weekend, the NHS turns 72, and it is the people who make it what it is today who will rightly take centre stage. Nina Nana, ITV News. Human rights. What are human rights? Well, human rights are the values which keep society fair, just and equal. They protect children, the elderly, people in care, victims of domestic violence, people with mental health problems, religious groups, teachers, soldiers, and yes, prisoners. They protect all of us. They protect you. Our human rights are protected by law. That means we can do something if our rights are attacked. But not everyone loves human rights. Some want to water them down, even scrap them. Our rights are under threat, so it's time to get educated. Societies used to be controlled by all-powerful rulers who could be horribly unjust. Kings only gave rights to people they liked. Over thousands of years, people fought for equality, and with every hard-won right came new laws that improved how we lived. But in the 20th century, brutal dictators came to power. They ruled by fear, like the kings of the past. Those hard-won rights, they were dismantled on an unimaginable scale. After World War II, the democracies got together and said, never again. They created a simple document setting out the basic rights we all need to live a dignified life. The European Convention puts rights, not rulers, at the heart of our society. Like the right to life, to liberty, to free speech. Then, in 1998, Parliament passed the Human Rights Act, which made our human rights part of UK law. This means public bodies like hospitals and schools must respect our rights, and if they don't, we can go to our local court to enforce them. Now, because of human rights, patients in hospitals must be treated with compassion. Journalists cannot be forced to reveal their sources. Soldiers must be given proper equipment. Gay people have to be treated equally, and the police cannot keep our DNA forever if we're innocent. We have to be treated fairly, at work, at home, in school, anywhere, everywhere. Our human rights are hard won. They're part of our British heritage. We are proud of them. If we lose them, vulnerable people will pay the biggest price. Know your rights. Celebrate them. Protect them. Share this video if you think human rights matter. Go on. Share it. There is no magic bullet for getting from where we are to where we ought to be or where we would like to be. But there are several things that I think are imperative. The first is we have to begin by focusing on inequality of opportunity, making sure that the life prospects of a young person do not depend to the extent that they do on the income and wealth of his parents. And that means breaking the pattern of intergenerational transmission of advantage and disadvantage. It also means having good tax and transfer systems and progressive taxes. And it means rewriting the rules of the market economy. We have to create a fairer 
in a more just economy and a fairer and more just society. My name is Rutger Breckman. I'm a historian. And in my humble opinion, bin men and women should be paid more than bankers. So a good way to illustrate this point is to look at a couple of strikes that happened throughout history. So for example, in New York, 1968, there was a big strike of bin men. They were just angry that their wages were not going up anymore. So they said, you know what, we're gonna go on strike and, and you'll, you'll see just how important we are. And indeed, Six days later, you know, the state of emergency had to be declared. New York really couldn't handle it. Turns out you can't do without bin men. Two years later in Ireland, there was another strike, in this case of bankers. It's the only strike that I know of throughout history where the bankers actually went on strike. And all the experts at that point, all the economists, they all predicted disaster. This was supposed to be like a heart attack for the economy. But then the strike started and nothing much happened really. It actually lasted for six months in the end. So <laughs> the garbage collectors were on strike for six days, state of emergency. The bankers go on strike for six months and nothing much happens. You know, the economy just kept growing. The businesses kept operating. There are nowadays many people in professions in say Wall Street or Silicon Valley that, you know, are often described as the visionaries and the whiskers who come up with all these wonderful products. There was someone at Facebook who worked there for years and said, the best minds of my generation are thinking about how to make people click and you know, that's, that's one of the tragedies of our time, is that we're wasting so much talent. There are so many smart people right now in jobs that don't contribute anything. And it's not necessary, it's not inevitable. We need to rethink who the real wealth creators actually are in our society. So there's some fascinating research, actually, new research from two Dutch economists, Max van Lent and Robert van Der, who looked at this whole phenomenon of what they call socially useless jobs. They ask people the question, do you think your job is actually valuable? Do you contribute anything to the common good? It turns out that in modern economies, developed economies, 25% of the workforce says, I don't know, uh, maybe not, or probably not. Uh, if I go on strike, no one really cares. Now, who are these people is an interesting question. It turns out that actually they have wonderful LinkedIn profiles. You know, they have wonderful, excellent salaries. They're often at the, at the at the top of the pyramid. You know, they're bankers, corporate lawyers, consultants. Basically, you know, a lot of people sitting in offices all day, sending emails to people they don't like, writing reports no one's ever gonna read, but still making a lot of money. So that's quite fascinating, right? That the rest of the population is supporting this whole class of people, you know, who don't really contribute anything, right? What we're doing is we're spending billions of pounds to educate our best and brightest and they go to Oxford and Cambridge and then they go on and they do jobs that they absolutely don't like I mean it's not me saying it, it's people themselves saying it where they don't really contribute anything what's going on here who are the real wealth creators and the reality here is I think is that we're living in an inverse welfare state where most wealth is actually created at the bottom by people who are doing the real work the teachers the nurses the garbage collectors you name it this state of affairs it's not inevitable, we can change it. And I would like to live in a society where we actually pay people according to their contribution, right? Where we have a real meritocracy. And in such a society, I believe, in the long run, bin men and women would be paid more than bankers. Imagine your friend invites you to a party. You arrive and there's lots of people, decorations, food and drink. There's enough for everyone. When you're hosted by someone that generous, you don't have to worry about your needs. You can just enjoy yourself and focus on the people around you. Yeah, that's what a good host wants for her guests. And this is the picture of the world that we find in the Bible. Creation is an expression of God's generous love. He's the host and humans are his guests in a world of opportunity and abundance. And we're called to keep the party going, to spread his goodness. This is a beautiful picture, but it's not the way people experience the world. Rather, we find a world of scarcity and struggle, not abundance. 
And Jesus grew up in that kind of world. Under military occupation, people losing their land or families to debt and poverty. And yet, he would say things like this. Look at the birds. They don't store up food for themselves, yet they have enough. Or consider the wildflowers. They're beautiful and abundant, and they don't stress about their existence. And you all should live that way, too. But surely Jesus knew that things don't always work out. I mean, sometimes there really isn't enough. And Jesus did experience poverty firsthand, but he viewed the world through the story of the Hebrew scriptures, which claimed that our scarcity problem isn't caused by a lack of resources. Rather, the problem is our mindset that God can't be trusted. Maybe God's holding out on me. Maybe there isn't enough, and maybe I need to take matters into my own hands. And once we're deceived into that mindset of scarcity, we can justify the impulse to take care of me and mine before anyone else. And that leads to envy, and anger, violence, and a world where it seems like there's not enough. The party's over. It's turned into a battleground. But God wants humans to experience his generosity. And so he chooses one people, the family of Abraham. And he promises to give them the abundance that he wants for everybody else. God will provide what they need. All they have to do is trust his generosity. And through them, the whole world will see how generous the host really is. But that's not what happens. Abraham's descendants, the Israelites, enter a land of abundance, and they promptly forget the host who gave it to them. They act like it's all theirs, and like there's not enough. And it leads to war and Israel's self-destruction. If I were the host of this party, I think I'd just give up. But God doesn't give up. What he does is surprising. He gives another gift. Another gift? Yeah, but this gift is different. What God gives is himself. All right, and Jesus, the host himself, comes to join in on the spoiled party. And notice, Jesus lives with the conviction that there is enough and that our generous host can be trusted. His mindset of abundance allowed him to live sacrificially and generously even towards his enemies. And Jesus called his followers to trust in God's abundance like him. And that's why he said things like, sell your possessions and give to the poor, or don't worry about your life. He's inviting us to live by a different story, one that is built on trust in God's goodness and love. But living generously doesn't mean life is going to go well. I mean, look at Jesus. He was betrayed by his friends, and he suffered. And this was no surprise to Jesus. He knew that people would take advantage of his generosity. In fact, that was his plan. Really? Yeah, think about it. Jesus knows that we're all hopelessly deceived by this lie that there's not enough. Yeah, that lie needs to be defeated. And so that's what Jesus was doing when he gave us the gift of his life. Jesus' death was the ultimate expression of God's generous love. Yeah, God's love can turn death into life. And scarcity back into abundance. Or as the Apostle Paul put it, you know the gift of our Lord Jesus the Messiah, that even though he was rich, for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. And Jesus called his followers to live like the real party has begun. Yes, he called it the kingdom of God. And our invitation to this party is yet another gift, the personal presence of God's own spirit that can teach us how to trust the generosity of the host, just like Jesus did. Yeah, and when you believe there's enough, you start seeing opportunities for generosity everywhere with our time and money, our attention. Yes, one of the most important ways that we can experience the abundance of God's new creation is sharing with others because of our trust that God is the generous host. Today we are talking about equity and equality. But you might be wondering, wait, aren't these the same thing? They look the same, they sound similar, so aren't they the same? No, in fact, they're really different concepts, even though a lot of us get the two confused. So let's break them down. You probably already know what we mean when we say equality. We're talking about two things that are the same or have a similar value. When we treat two people or two groups of people equally, we make sure that they have or get the same things. For example, if I wanna give Betty some apples, then I need to give Ben the same number of apples to treat them with equality. Along the same lines, 
if I want to give the nursing program a budget increase, then I need to make sure that I give the culinary arts program the same budget increase to treat them with equality. That makes sense. But that's not the same thing as equity. Equity can be defined as giving everyone what they need to be successful. In other words, it's not giving everyone the exact same thing. And here's where the difference between equity and equality really come in. Because it's important to remember that if we give everyone the exact same thing, expecting that we'll make people equal, it assumes that everyone started out in the same place. So here's an example. In this instance, we give everyone the exact same box, we treat them with equality, so that they can see over the fence. Well, that's great for the person on the left because they were already taller, but it's not so great for the person on the right who still can't see over the fence. From an equity perspective, we wouldn't want everyone to have the same size box because everyone isn't the same height to start out with. With an equity mindset, we would get everyone what they need to raise them up to the same level. Here's another example. With equality in mind, we can treat everyone the same and give them all the same bike, but that doesn't really help the person on the left who can't ride that kind of bike or the person in the middle that is too small for that bike. So when we think about this situation with equity in mind, equity tells us that we need to give everybody a different kind of bike so they can all enjoy a bike ride. As you might guess, this is where the concept of fairness gets tricky for some folks. We often think that being fair means that everybody gets the same thing, and that's what we were taught when we were growing up. But fairness really only works when we're all the same to start out with. So this is a new idea for many of us to think about. There is this great American saying that people just need to work hard enough and pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. It's this idea that everyone can be successful if you just work hard enough. Well, that's a lot easier to do when some of us were born with longer arms to pull up those bootstraps, or maybe we were given longer bootstraps when we bought our boots. So let's think about moving away from the bootstrap idea and instead think about shoes. There is a quote by Nahid Dasani that goes, equality is giving everyone a shoe, but equity is giving everyone a shoe that fits. <laughs> If you were a praying mantis, it would be socially acceptable to devour your mate. And if you're a honey badger, you have no regard for other animals. You don't care. If you're a panda with twins, it's normal to abandon one to take care of the other. But if humans do any of these things, we would call it wrong, unfair, or unjust. Yeah, why is that? Why do humans care so much about justice? Well, the Bible has a fascinating response to that question. On page one, humans are set apart from all other creatures as the image of God. Yeah, God's representatives who rule the world by his definition of good and evil. And this identity, it's the bedrock of the Bible's view of justice. All humans are equal before God and have the right to be treated with dignity and fairness no matter who you are. And that would be nice if we all did that. But we know how the world really works. And the Bible addresses that too. It shows how we are constantly redefining good and evil to our own advantage at the expense of others. Yeah, self-preservation. And the weaker someone is, the easier it is to take advantage of them. And so in the biblical story, we see this happening on a personal level, but also in families and then in communities and in whole civilizations that create injustice, especially towards the vulnerable. But the story doesn't end there. Out of this whole mess, God chose a man named Abraham to start a new kind of family. Specifically, Abraham was to teach his family to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. Yeah, doing righteousness, that's a Bible word I don't really use, but what comes to mind is being a good person. But what does that even mean, being good? The biblical Hebrew word for righteousness is tzedakah, and it's more specific. It's an ethical standard that refers to right relationships between people. It's about treating others as the image of God. With the God-given dignity they deserve. And this word justice, it's the Hebrew word mishpat. 
It can refer to retributive justice. Like if I steal something, I pay the consequences. Exactly. Yet most often in the Bible, mishpat refers to restorative justice. It means going a step further, actually seeking out vulnerable people who are being taken advantage of and helping them. Yeah, some people call this charity. But mishpat involves way more. It means taking steps to advocate for the vulnerable and changing social structures to prevent injustice. So justice and righteousness are about a radical, selfless way of life. Yeah, and you find this idea all over the Bible. Like, here, in the book of Proverbs, what does it mean to bring about just righteousness? Open your mouth for those who can't speak for themselves. And what do these words mean for the prophets, like Jeremiah? Rescue the disadvantaged and don't tolerate oppression or violence against the immigrant, the orphan, and the widow. And like here, look in the book of Psalms. The Lord God upholds justice for the oppressed, gives food to the hungry, and sets the prisoner free but he thwarts the way of the wicked. Whoa, he thwarts the wicked? Yeah, in Hebrew, the word wicked is rasha. It means guilty or in the wrong. It refers to someone who mistreats another human, ignoring their dignity as an image of God. So justice and righteousness is a big deal to God. Yes, it's what Abraham's family, the Israelites, were to be all about. They ended up as immigrant slaves, being oppressed unjustly in Egypt. And so God confronted Egypt's evil, declaring them to be rasha, guilty of injustice. And so he rescued Israel. But the tragic irony of the Old Testament story is that these redeemed people went on to commit the same acts of injustice against the vulnerable. And so God sent prophets who declared Israel guilty. But they weren't the only ones. There's injustice everywhere. Yeah, some people actively perpetrate injustice. Others receive benefits or privileges from unjust social structures they take for granted. And sadly, history has shown that when the oppressed gain power, they often become oppressors themselves. So we all participate in injustice, actively or passively, even unintentionally. We're all the guilty ones. And so this is the surprising message of the biblical story. God's response to humanity's legacy of injustice is to give us a gift, the life of Jesus. He did righteousness and justice, and yet he died on behalf of the guilty. But then God declared Jesus to be the righteous one when he rose from the dead. And so now Jesus offers his life to the guilty so that they too can be declared righteous before God, not because of anything they've done, but because of what Jesus did for them. The earliest followers of Jesus experienced this righteousness from God, not just as a new status, but as a power that changed their lives and compelled them to act in surprising new ways. Yeah, if God declared someone righteous when they didn't deserve it, the only reasonable response is to go and seek righteousness and justice for others. This is a radical way of life, and it's not always convenient or easy. It's courageously making other people's problems my problems. This is what Jesus meant by loving your neighbor as yourself. It's about a lifetime commitment fueled by the words of the ancient prophet Micah. God has told you, humans, what is good and what the Lord requires of you is to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God.